Hi, my name is Ivy, and this is a sample class. What our language arts classes are going to look like at Sparks Academy. We currently offer high school language arts one, two, and three, the good and the beautiful level seven, and of course our writing consultation. So I want to dive in and just show you what the classes look like on Canvas so that you have an idea of what your student will be looking at. This is language arts three, which is done through the good and the beautiful, and this is the home page. It is basically the home room. It has access to the announcements, discussion, and assignments. Um, if your student will go over to their account and on the settings, click notifications and enable all notifications. Whenever, whenever something is added to one of these, they will get an email. Um, there's also a file section, which will have all of these different pieces to download. They can be accessed online or you can print them out. Also, it's suggested that your student has a digital notebook through Google Docs or OneDrive. That way they can keep a running tab of all of their writing assignments in the same place. And when it's time to turn them in, they're all right there. These are the suggested pencils or the, well, their pencils is one of them. Um, pencils, paper, eraser, the architecture collection, all of the things that are suggested for the particular art for Language Arts 3. Now inside of here, your student will have access to, let's look at assignments. And we'll just randomly choose week six. So when they get to week six, the topics covered are going to be Central America, Brazil, and travel writing. Assignments for that week are to work on poetry memorization, some chapters in their Florence Nightingale book, studying the Central America card, and doing their unit book, page 18, pages 18 through 22, and starting to work on that travel article. They have some extra videos, which will cover the topics that we're looking at. Um, these also cover grammar concepts. Usually I ask that the students at least open the videos and see what they have. Um, geography, history, things like that. I'm gonna want them to watch the videos because they accompany the books that we're reading and what we're talking about. Grammar concepts, if it's something that they've truly mastered, nouns, verbs, something basic, then that's up to them whether they wanna watch that extra video or not. Also, the Class discussion will be down here at the bottom. It'll have a weekly discussion question where they're directed to go and not only add their, um, their discussion element, but also to do what we call peer review, where they go and they, they look at what other people have written and they're going to be expected to, um, to add to their discussion threads as well. And then up here in between weekly assignments and topics, there's going to be the weekly lecture video. That's between 20 and 30 minutes of me and some other guest speakers coming on and talking. I've got authors lined up. I've got different people from different areas of the world to focus on geography and history and where we will have our actual class lecture. Now, this is an entire week's worth of work. For week six, this is all that they're doing the entire week. So it does not all have to be done at one day. It's really not as overwhelming as it looks when you look at it the first time. And when it's time for live classes, we have live classes once a quarter. Those will be here where they can, I'll have to hit start, but they'll have a, a button here that says join. Um, those classes they'll know in advance, plenty of time for the time and the date. It's already on the syllabus, which week it's going to be. And so if they're unable to join, we know that people have, you know, not everyone is flexible. Not everyone has the ability to stop what they're doing. They may not be able to make it. Um, all of the classes are going to be recorded, the conferences, and so we would just ask that your student watch that and participate in the student discussion before the next week. Live classes for language arts are going to be mostly focusing on book clubs, um, discussing the books, discussing the topics that we're doing, bouncing ideas off of each other, maybe sharing artwork. It's a way for them to, to collaborate face-to-face. -face. Um, by the time they get to the first conference, the first live conference at week eight, they should have already been interfacing with each other for a couple of weeks and this will have this will give them a chance to put a face with a name and develop those relationships and then like i said we'll be focusing heavily on book discussions as well so that's what it looks like inside of a language arts class i am going to leave you now with a sample class to check out um, it is not for week six but uh, i hope that this helps you Hi, welcome to week three of the Good and the Beautiful Language Arts High School Level One. 
Today, we have a lot to talk about, so I just want to dive right into class. This week, we are talking about New England, the difference between protagonist and antagonist, some basic sentence structures, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and then we're going to be covering your writing prompts as well. Your assignments this week. This is a heavy week, but I promise we're going to make it up to you next week. Um, so this week, you're continuing to work on your poetry memorization. You're going to read chapters seven through eight of Just David. You have your insights journal to work on. You're going to want to put that into either a Google Docs or um, your OneDrive, some sort of digital notebook. It can even be um, a Microsoft Word document if you would prefer. Just keep everything in one place. Make sure that you have things organized, almost like a journal with a date for each entry. And even more important than that, make sure that you have typed the prompt for your entry into your journal at the beginning of each um, assignment. Because when it's time to turn those in, you might have multiple writing assignments on there. If I don't know what the prompt is, or if um, Ms. Martin, who is also helping us grade writing, doesn't know what the prompt is, it's going to be very difficult to assess your writing. You have a geography card to work on. I want you to find the New England card and start working on memorizing states and capitals from that region. And then in your booklet, you have pages 11 and 12, 16 through 19, and 20 through 35. That sounds like a lot, but there are several art pages in that 20 through 35. It also includes your unit review, which we're going to talk about towards the end of class. You have extra videos to watch. There are a lot of them. Like I said, this is a heavier week than normal. Um, and at the very bottom, we will have a discussion question. It'll be a light discussion question this week. So let's just jump into our topics. I want to start by talking about sentence structures and protagonist versus antagonist. All right, there are three basic sentence structures, um, simple, compound, and complex. And then we'll get into compound complex sentences later. Simple sentences have only one independent clause, one subject, one predicate. Some examples are, I eat pizza, my students are crazy, or I'm going to eat pecan pie. Then we have compound sentences, which have at least two independent clauses. These include your fanboys, um, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Um, you can make a compound sentence with two or more independent clauses, a comma, and one of your fanboys. I am not a morning person, so I drink a lot of coffee. My cats are friendly, and they like to meet new people. My students drive me crazy, but... I mostly like them. Some other examples of ways that you can do this is um, with two or more related independent clauses and a semicolon. I am not a morning person, semicolon. I drink a lot of coffee. My cats are friendly, semicolon. They like to meet new people. My students drive me crazy, semicolon. I mostly like them. Then we have complex sentences, which have an independent clause and at least one dependent clause. Some examples are, if the sentence begins with a dependent clause, you will add a comma before the independent clause. But if it ends with a dependent clause, no comma is needed. Let's look at how that works. Because I need coffee, comma, I drink it every day. I drink coffee every day because I need it. Um, I didn't sleep well because my cats were being loud. Or you can reverse that and say, because my cats were being loud, comma, I didn't sleep well. Since winter is coming, comma, I think I'll knit a warm sweater because I'm always cold. Now here, as you can see in red, we have two dependent clauses, one at the beginning of the sentence separated by a comma and one at the end of the sentence. You can also create a compound complex sentence with two or more independent clauses and one or more dependent clauses. So that's when you're gonna take a compound sentence and then add a dependent clause to it. The cat ran off when I chased him, comma, but I know he was only playing. So here we have the cat ran off and I know he was only playing. Those are gonna be your independent clauses. And then the red one, when I chased him, is your dependent clause. My students are crazy, comma, but, I like them, and then here's your dependent clause, because they're nice. When I went to the store, comma, my cats wanted me to pick up some treats, comma, but I forgot, 
because I was thinking about school. In this one, we have two dependent and two independent clauses. Can you spot which ones they are? Right, the ones in red are gonna be your dependent clauses. Switching gears just a little bit. We were just doing grammar and now we're going to do some literary um, elements. We've got protagonist versus antagonist. So a protagonist is a central figure who tries to resolve the conflict in the story. He's often portrayed as the good guy, the hero. Um, it can be a human, it can be an animal, and often we get more information about the protagonist than the antagonist. The antagonist is the main force that creates conflict for the protagonist. He's often portrayed as the bad guy or the anti-hero. Um, he could be a single group of characters, an institution, or even a concept. And not much information is provided about the antagonist usually other than he's a bad guy. Who is your protagonist here? Who is your antagonist here? Okay, so think about your stereotypes. If you haven't seen Star Wars, and I think most of you probably have, um, think about your stereotypes, how good and evil are portrayed. Um, generally, good is portrayed in these lighter colors, whereas evil is portrayed in the darker colors. So we have Luke Skywalker, he is going to be your protagonist, and then we've got Darth Vader, who is going to be your antagonist. So those are some fairly simple concepts, um, just pieces of literary devices and um, grammar. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about Just David, which we're reading this week. You should have read chapters one through six. Um, I would love to know what you guys think of this book. Are you enjoying it? Are you learning anything from it? Are you excited to see what comes next? What kind of questions do you have? Um, for your discussion question today, I want you to write what you think is gonna happen next. Because when we left off, David really didn't have anywhere to go. Um, he was with the Hollies and he doesn't really get along with the Hollies so much right now, does he? So I wanna know what do you think is going to happen next? Um, a couple of questions I have for you this week to think about also. Whoops. Why do you think that David felt that taking walks was so important? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Holly do not think that, that they're important. And yet it's a very important thing to David. Um, he was, he's almost hurt when they won't take these walks with him. Why is it so important to him? And my other question for you, I'd like to talk about something on page 40. There is a passage here. So a parent has the opportunity to teach children to love and appreciate certain things. What things have your parents taught you? It's gonna take a while. That's something that I want you to think about kind of in the back of your head for the rest of the day. What have they taught you? What kind of um, morals? What, what do you love and appreciate because your parents have taught you to love and appreciate it? On page 40, we read, David frowned in mild wonder. I wasn't idle, sir. Father said I must never be that. He said every instrument was needed in the great orchestra of life. And then I was one, you know, even if I was only a little boy. And he said, if I kept still and didn't do my part, the harmony wouldn't be complete. That passage, it's a little thing. And um, you probably skimmed right over it. But remember, David's father and David both have these violins in their life. And the violins are very important to them, which means that music has a role of importance to them. So harmony, which comes with music, is also very important to them. How do you harmonize in your own life? David right now is not harmonizing where he is. His father is gone. He's with these strangers. He doesn't know his place in the world and he's out of tune. We'll have to see if he comes back in tune by the end of the book. But I'm sure that there have been times in your life when you have felt out of tune and there are times when you have felt completely in tune with the people around you. You do not have to put this in the discussion question because this is, this is personal, but I want you to spend some time this week thinking about that particular thing. Um, how do you get out of tune? What makes you get out of tune? And when that happens, how do you get yourself back in tune? What brings you in tune? How do you do your part to harmonize with the rest of the world? So, um, and then we're gonna be talking about Just David as well as Harriet Tubman, which is our next book, when we get to our live classes. The book, Just David, is set in New England, and that's what we're going to talk about this week for geography. So where is New England? 
If you've been studying your geography card, you should already know this. Um, New England includes Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. It's a highly industrial area, but it also has many fields, woods, and small towns. It's located up in the northeastern corner of the United States and made up of those six states. What are your state capitals? Hartford, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, Concord, New Hampshire, Montpelier, Vermont, and Augusta, Maine. We're gonna briefly look at the flags um, and symbols of each of these states. Uh, there's the main flag, it's state tree, I want to say, but it's possible it's the state flower, is the pine cone with its tassel. Uh, must be the state flower because New Hampshire state flower is the purple lilacs and there's its flag. Vermont's flag and their state flower, the red clover. Massachusetts with the Mayflower, Rhode Island with the Violet, and Connecticut with its Mountain Laurel. So what are some of the characteristics of, of the New England Yankee? Um, Yankees are the people who live in New England. They have a distinct character that's shaped by the history and the geography of the region, um, including the Puritans who landed there. The land is harsher, the soil is thin and poor with lots of large stones, they have to be hard workers to survive. Uh, they're honest but smart, like Frederick Tudor, realistic and untalkative, like President Calvin Coolidge, tend to be independent, and abolitionists during the um, anti-slavery movement. These are your Puritans who landed at Plymouth Rock. The sea is integral to life in New England. When they first arrived, the triangular trade was important for several hundred years. And triangular trade was where New England sent, um, they sent rum, which was to trade for slaves over to West Africa. West Africa sold the slaves over to the West Indies. The West Indies brought that sugar to New England, which they made the rum in New England and they sent it back to West Africa. And that's how that triangle worked from New England to West Africa to the West Indies. They took other goods and things at the same time, but that was the primary trade. Uh, fishing for codfish and whaling were also important activities. Um, clipper ships, those were fast moving ships that were um, Yankee ships in the mid 1800s. But towards the late 1800s, the sea was no longer such an important role. And these are some of your whaling towns, New Bedford, Salem, Nantucket and Marblehead is where Harvard University is. It's the oldest university, it was built in the 1600s. A quarter of the people who live in Cambridge today are students. It is built on the Charles River. Cambridge, of course, being right outside of Boston. So this is the Charles River. Rowing is the oldest inter-university inter sport in the United States. They still row there today. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne was one famous New England writer. He lived from 1804 to 1864 in Salem, Massachusetts. And his ancestor's original name was Hathorne, not Hawthorne. His great-great-grandfather was actually a judge in one of the 1692 Salem witch trials. He felt shame and guilt based on his ancestor's role in those trials. And he sometimes wrote that into his stories. He self-published Fanshawe in 1828, and he published some short stories under a pseudonym. In 1837, he published The Twice Told Tales, which was a collection of short stories, and then he published The House of the Seven Gables. This is Hawthorne. And here are some pictures from the Salem Witch Trials. And then there is the purported, um, the purported house of the Seven Gables. Also hailing from New England were Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who we're gonna be studying further in your unit booklets this week. And Thoreau was an American essayist, poet, philosopher, and environmentalist. He was also a leading transcendentalist. He was famous for his essay, Civil Disobedience. And he wrote a book called Walden. What is transcendentalism? 
It says that divinity is in nature and humanity rather than in a God outside our world. It was influenced by Hinduism. It said that people are good by nature, but that society tends to corrupt them. And it focuses on intuition rather than reason or rationalism. Civil disobedience, which is what he wrote, um, said that an individual refusing to obey laws that he or she thinks are unjust is okay. Um, it was a peaceful form of political protest. Thoreau actually inspired Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. A just society has fair laws, but most societies aren't like that. So what can you do? The opponent of slavery, Henry David Thoreau, gave one answer in his essay on civil disobedience. Follow your conscience and break the law on moral grounds rather than be a cog in an unjust system. As he put it, let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. Influenced by Thoreau, Mahatma Gandhi championed non-violent civil disobedience, or Satyagraha, in his campaign for Indian independence. In 1930, he organized a long march to the sea. By picking up a few crystals of salt from the mud, he defied a British law forbidding Indians from making their own salt, inspiring thousands. On a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger. She, too, was arrested. Her symbolic act of defiance helped focus the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, Jr., another fan of Thoreau's essay, staged major protests against unjust laws affecting America's black community. So that's some ways that civil disobedience and Thoreau have inspired people um, throughout history and up to modern day. Walden, which was the book that he wrote, was named after Walden Pond in Massachusetts. Thoreau lived alone in a cabin near Walden Pond for two years. Um, he was a spiritual person and he reflected upon living simply close to nature. He had a minimalist lifestyle using only the necessities. This was a reconstruction of the cabin that he lived in. And that's Walden Palm, which he wrote about. Let's switch gears to another transcendentalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was an essayist, lecturer, and poet, um, also a leader. He was critical of society and promoted individualism, but his most famous essay is called Nature. He was part of the Romantic movement. Romanticism um, puts an emphasis on emotion, intuition, nature, and beauty. And it was a direct reaction to the Enlightenment, which had an emphasis on reason, science, and observation. Nature was his most famous essay. It suggested that God is in nature and that we can understand reality by studying nature. Um, the problem here is that humans don't fully accept nature's beauty. You will have a video to watch about Emerson in your um, class lecture videos. So, all right, that's a lot of material that we've covered this week. If you need to step back and break it down bit by bit, if you need to take notes, totally fine, totally understandable. Your insights journal, I'd like to cover some of the topics. If you will turn to page 31, we have an insights journal this week. It is 300 words. That probably sounds like a lot, but it's only gonna end up being a couple of paragraphs when you write it. You have five choices for your insights journal. The first one, Ralph Waldo Emerson and the character David in the book, Just David, both find joy and peace in nature. David declares that his walks in the woods help him stay in tune. Emerson said, in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. So your assignment is, based on what you learn from your assignment in this unit of observing photographs of trees in New England, do you feel that taking time to observe nature, whether in art or real life, brings peace, calm, and beauty to your life? And if so, why? Now, if not, I want to know why not. 
but that's only one of your options. You have four more options to choose from if you don't like that. Number two, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. What does that mean to you and how can you display that in your life? Option number three, Ralph Waldo Emerson also said, never lose an opportunity of seeing anything beautiful for beauty is God's handwriting. Again, what does this quote mean to you and how can you find it in your everyday life? Number four, what are the most important things to gain from an education? Number five, if you don't like any of those choices, write about an insight or insights that you gained through a recent personal experience. For that, you're going to have to say what the experience is and then talk about the insights. As you're doing your insights journal, since this is going to be your first one, you have a rubric here to look through. This is how we will be looking at it when we grade it. It has to be at least 300 words. Does it grab my attention or do you say, well, the very first thing? Make me want to read this. Does it have meaningful, insightful thoughts? Does it include detail and description? Does it vary your sentence structure? Um, complex, compound, various types of sentences. We've talked about those. If you have any further questions, your grammar and writing guide on page 92, will have more information about that. Does it have your information ordered correctly and logically? You wouldn't want to go, well, the third thing that happened was, and then the eighth thing that happened, and then the first thing. You want to have everything ordered correctly. And then finally, make sure that you take a moment after you've rewritten it and looked over it for content to go back over it again for grammar, punctuation, capitalization, all of those little things. When you're turning in a paper, you want it to look as professional as possible. You have your videos, you've got your journals, um, you've got some reading to do. Not as much reading this week as last week. Next week, we will come together. We will talk about what's going on in Just David. And we will wrap up with a review of vocabulary and grammar. We'll be wrapping up unit one. Um, we'll also be covering your art project and you'll get to dive into your very first art project. So take some time, relax a little bit, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.